We are the last session of the afternoon, so I feel like we're batting a bit of cleanup here for a baseball analogy. Uh, thank you so much to Dean Jay now for the support she's given here to address the question of financial stability in an era of growing risk. And thank you so much to our sponsors for a really great day. We have a lot of material to work off of, so we're excited to um, especially roll off the last few conversations around cyber risk and conflict. Um, I'm Catherine Rosen. I'm moderating today. I'd love to introduce our panelists um, right here, Trish Mosser. Trish is director of the Initiative on Central Banking and Financial Policy. She's also a senior research scholar here at SIPA and a senior fellow. Trish has a long career at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and also at the Treasury Department where she was at the Office of Financial Research. Next to Trish is Jay Healy, who you heard from earlier today. Uh, but we didn't get to give all the accolades of Jay since he introduced himself. Jay is a director of the program on the future of cyber risks and senior research scholar at SIPA. He's also a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Jay has had a long tenure in cybersecurity, as was evidenced by his content today. Um, he has served in the Air Force. He was at Goldman Sachs. He was vice chairman of the FSI SAC and also at the White House, so an array of policy and implementation roles over the years. And uh, to the far, my far left is Tom Whiff, Vice Chairman of Institutional Securities Group at Morgan Stanley. We're thrilled to be joined by Tom here today and to contribute his views. He's an industry practitioner, uh, long tenure, safe to say. Uh, he was instrumental in financial crisis response and reform. Um, he's currently leading the firm's business continuity management organization. So in that role, he's responsible for strategies, planning, and risk management in the context of potential cyber and fiscal Physical, not fiscal, <laughs> physical <laughs> disruptions. <laughs> fiscal would be interesting too. So I'm going to kick it off uh, just to give our conversation some context. Since the financial crisis a decade ago, government authorities, including regulators and the financial sector, have been working um, to improve overall resiliency and financial stability. These efforts have been mostly aimed at preventing the panics of the last 10 years. At the same time, in a parallel effort, governments and industry have been grappling with increasing cyber risks, increasing sophistication of cyber adversaries, increased frequency of attacks. We're also growing ever reliant on technology. At SIPA, Jay, Trish, and I came together and formed a project called the Cyber Risk to Financial Stability Project, really in an effort to help further resilience in the industry. Our work is focused on the linkages between cyber risk and financial stability. We started with the recognition that cyber risk has not been well understood in the context of financial vulnerabilities and contagion channels, really all these things that we learned through the financial crisis. And the cyber folks and financial stability folks don't speak the same language, though they use the same words often, words like vulnerability, a word we heard often here today, but they mean two different things. So to better promote collaboration of these two communities, we raise the following questions. Questions like, how do cyber risk and financial risk interact with each other in ways that may cause a systemic event? What are the transition chan transmission channels for this instability? Is there anything about cyber risk that's fundamentally new or different from other risks that we, are really we know of in the financial services area? How should economists, regulators, policymakers, a lot of the folks we've spoken about earlier today, how should they be thinking about cyber in the context of the financial stability efforts? The linkages are multifaceted, and really one, do the complexity of both financial systems and IT infrastructure, and two, this interconnectedness, this growing interdependency of finance and cyberspace. The questions raised can't be answered without having active engagement of both experts in cyber and in the business. Um, so we put together a high-level framework, which you can see on our website here at SIPA.com, <laughs> called the Cyber Risk to Financial Stability Project. And our framework is really to facilitate analysis of how cyber risk can induce systemic financial stability, instability. It's a real practical application. And we've asked three questions. One is, what it, how do we assess financial risk from a particular cyber incident? The question folks, or the comment folks always say is, oh, a cyber attack can take down the financial system. How do you think through that? Importantly, a question that we don't ask as often, but that cyber professionals have been asking of the business, and that is, 
what particular vulnerabilities are there in a marketplace, in a market, in a financial product that could be exploited by a cyber adversary that in turn could cause an event of cyber um, of financial instability? And then thirdly, what we call bottoms up. And it's really, what are the amplifiers and dampeners, the trends in the system, new emerging technologies that could either, either alleviate, alleviate or exacerbate risks? And as we thought through this framework, we can't really get there without understanding the transmission channels of how we translate this cyber risk to a financial risk. And a uh, few of them were highlighted today um, within the conversation. I'm just gonna enumerate these before I pass it off for other comments from the panel. Um, their substitutability of core IT um, and financial functions. So if you think about having, um, in particular, a, market a financial market utility, that's a critical function for clearing and settling, say, if that was to go down due to a cyber event. Loss of confidence, we heard a lot about today. Integrity of data. And then lastly, we've em we emphasize, again, interconnectedness as its own means of transmission. Uh, so I'm going to stop there, having given you a highlight of our framework and our thinking through this. I'm going to throw it over to Trish first. She's going to dig into this financial stability side of this equation and the considerations to assess the linkages. Jay's going to pick up from there and speak to cyber considerations and give some examples, as well as Trish gives some examples to what I'm talking about. And then we're going to ask Tom to speak about what the industry is doing to internalize these linkages, how they're preparing and they're protecting themselves. And then we'll have a dialogue and some questions from there. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for taking your very late Friday afternoon to hang out with us for a little while. Um, uh, as Catherine suggested, there's pretty big gaps um, in understanding between those who manage cyber risks every day and those who monitor financial stability risks. They sort of speak a different language, as she mentioned. But part of that is also a question of approach. And I want to mention this right up front because it sort of colors the whole conversation that ends up happening between the policy people who think about the stability of the financial system and the folks who are really on the front lines of trying to manage um, cyber shocks. Financial stability is all about monitoring and measuring the system. It's not about trying to stop shocks, or even, frankly, mostly even identifying shocks. Um, it's almost completely silent, in fact, on the nature of shocks. That's partly because, frankly, the financial system gets hit by a 1,000 shocks a day. You can't stop them all. So instead, what you want to do is set up a system, a set of institutions, a set of markets, a set of infrastructures, a set of regulatory structure that allows for the resilience of the entire system, no matter what, what hits it. Um, and that's fine and is sensible, but for cybersecurity experts, it's all about stopping the shock. It's all about putting up defenses to stop or thwart or overcome a shock that comes down. So part of the disconnect here is literally an approach. Um, I, I want to talk about this and, and this issue of the disconnect a little bit, and then I'll get into an example at the end. But I'm going to do it from my perspective, which is obviously not as a cybersecurity expert, uh, but from the perspective of someone who has monitored and tried to control financial stability, uh, stability risks, um, policy institutions. So you, you can think the IMF, the Financial Stability Board, financial regulators, and central banks in many, many countries. And their approach to this problem um, starts from the realization that the financial system is, is a complex adaptive system. And I mean that in the sort of formal sense of the word. Um, what do we know about complex uh, um, adaptive systems, uh, whether they're physical or biological or economic? Um, well, first of all, they know they're pretty, typically pretty robust. But they very occasionally have absolutely catastrophic crises. Um, fortunately, these crises are rare. Um, but unfortunately, they are nearly impossible to predict, either in terms of their timing or in terms of the shock that will actually cause the system to tip over and go into crisis. So if you like prediction and stopping shocks doesn't work, and that's sort of an explanation why the financial stability world doesn't think about them very hard. Instead, policy institutions focus on measuring, if you like, the amplifiers and the feedback mechanisms that make the financial system somewhat fragile in the first place. Uh, the term of art um, in the financial stability world is vulnerabilities, but since I'm going to try to stay away from that because it means a different thing in cyber world, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to st stick to this. So what are some of these basic characteristics that all financial systems share? Well, first and foremost is leverage and maturity transformation. Um, basically, financial systems sort of exist to do leverage maturity transformation. Um, truth is, 
everybody who's a financial regulator would love to figure out how to run a capitalist economy without having a levered financial system, but nobody's figured out how to do it yet. So we are stuck with what we're stuck with. Um, uh, basically, by this I mean they are lending to finance long-term illiquid assets, and they're doing that by borrowing from others, that's the leverage part, usually at much, much shorter maturities than what they're lending at. Um, so the classic example of this is to make a 30-year mortgage loan to um, uh, uh, perhaps a not, particularly, not incredibly creditworthy borrower and finance that by borrowing either overnight or a week from some short-term investor. Often with, you know, like maybe if you're lucky, 4% skin in the game. Now that, that sounds like a crazy risky business to be in, but what I have just described to you is a bank. Um, exa almost exactly. Uh, it's a very risky business. Um, if you combine those two pieces with the, with the fact that financial risk is both endogenous and highly pro-cyclical, and by this I mean that when asset prices are going up is exactly when leverage is going up and exactly when maturity transformation is going up. So the world looks wonderful. So let's go out and take some more risk. I think Eric Talley made exactly this point this morning. Um, it's, an, it's both a human reaction and it's actually an outcome of classic risk management. Um, and so that feeds upon itself. If everybody takes more leverage when asset prices go up, then they buy more of the asset that's prices going up, which pushes its price up even further, which increases leverage. And you can see how this gets into a positive feedback loop. That's called a bubble, by the way, <laughs> when that happens. And the reverse, as it undoes, has exactly the same positive feedback loop, except in the negative direction. And, and if that happens, and it doesn't always happen, but if that happens and the system can't stabilize itself, that is exactly when you get bank runs and a financial crisis. So that's the basic dynamics of what they're concerned about. So what, are they me what, do the, what do central banks and the IMF and everyone, what do they measure? They try to measure leverage. They try to measure maturity transformation. They try to measure um, exactly how pro-cyclical the price of risk is at any particular point in time. There's a last piece that's very important here, particularly important for cyber, I think. And that is that complexity. The financial system is obviously very complex. It's extremely interconnected and frankly quite opaque. Um, and what that means is that idiosyncratic shocks to an individual firm aren't actually idiosyncratic. Um, I would go so far to say, as a slight exaggeration, that there's no such thing as an idiosyncratic uh, shock in finance. And the reason for that is that one firm's behavior in response to that shock immediately spills over to absolutely everybody else in the system, sometimes in large ways, sometimes in small ways. Moreover, the the firm that got hit with the shock very often does not take into account the impact their actions are going to have on the entire system. So there is an externality, to use the economist term, that, uh, that's very important. So, so where does cyber fit in here? Well, as I mentioned, cyber is all about uh, sort of preventing the shock in the first place and containing it through the, the quite complicated um, uh, transmission through technology channels. And that's mostly done in practice at the level of the firm. And I'm guessing Jay's going to talk about this a little more in a minute. And, and that's very important. Uh, do not get me wrong. The, 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 the stopping cyber attacks at their, at their source and inside a firm are incre is incredibly important. But frankly, cyber risk mitigation is pretty much silent on what the business and financial reactions are going to be to an attack. But it is exactly those business and financial reactions and what they, the firms do in response that can start and feed into exactly the contagion mechanisms and the feedback mechanisms I was just talking about. And that is one of the big missing links here. So, so where are we in understanding this phenomenon? Well, in the last couple of years, there have been several studies. Um, I'll get to ours in a minute. Um, but there are sort of a nascent set of studies that are beginning to look more closely at this. There's a very recent paper by Daryl Duffy of Stanford Business School that looks at liquidity runs in response to a cyber attack. There's a research project um, been going on for a year and a half or so at MIT to develop risk management and metrics, uh, <coughs> measurement metrics. Um, by the way, uh, using homomorphic encryption to, to gather the confidential data, by the way, which was also mentioned earlier today. And also recently, the Bank of England published a set of principles for how to think about regulating cyber risk that frankly are pretty different from the traditional regulatory principles for, measuring, uh, for, measuring other for managing other types of risk. So there's an acknowledgment out there that cyber is different, but it's the very, very, very beginning. We're not very far along. And 
finally, last and not least, of course, is the work that we've been doing here at Columbia to think more carefully about the transmission of cyber attacks across the financial system, not just through technology channels, but also through those financial channels and feedback mechanisms that I talked about. So how do we do that? I want to repeat a question that, that Catherine said in the introduction. What are the ways in which a cyber specific attack and its transmission through technology channels, sorry, I can't, I got to do this with my hands. I don't know what I'm going to do it. I love it, it's a karate kid. I, I know. <laughs> um, Wax on cyber uh, risk. There Wax on financial risk. Yeah. I know, it's true. Uh, I, I don't know how anybody does it. It was a movie but in how, the 80s. <laughs> How does that interact with all these dynamics over here that I was describing? Um, the simple answer to that is the proposal we make is to figure out where those things overlap. And if you like, it's to do this. All right. How do they intersect with each other? Where are the vulnerabilities in the technology world and how do they intersect with those financial vulnerabilities that I talked about a few minutes ago? Um, we think that's a very important exercise. There have been a few sort of small exercises in that direction, but I think a lot, we think a lot more could be done there. Now, I want to be really clear here that we're not suggesting that you boil the ocean and take on the entire financial system at once. That's, that's too much to do. Um, so let me give a very, uh, very concrete example. Uh, and that I'm going to use is for that example the tri-party repo market. And for those of you who are not a, a finance experts, I'll just quickly describe the tri-party repo market as a key funding and financing market for securities that's widely, widely used by many banks and uh, nearly all securities dealers. They borrow short-term cash from short-term investors, short-term borrowings. For example, say a money market mutual fund would be a pretty classic example. You and they lend overnight and in turn the security dealers of the banks give them back a long-term security and they get about somewhere between 95 and 99 cents on the dollar in terms of funding for that. So highly levered, massive maturity transformation, right? 30-year treasury bond over here where you're getting basically borrowing overnight for massive mismatch. So it's the definition of leverage maturity transformation. Um, we know it's fragile. It was run twice during the financial crisis. It suffered a run. There were, after the financial crisis, a very massive effort across the private sector and the regulatory sector to fix many of the vulnerabilities in the market. But they certainly couldn't fix them all. Uh, and in fact, there were a series of white papers that sort of acknowledged that there are still very significant vulnerabilities there. Um, on top of that, it has a very highly concentrated infrastructure yeah. supporting the market, a single provider, effectively, who provides collateral services, pricing, settlement, payments, and basically manages the entire structure. So it has, if you like, a particularly concentrated, at least, infrastructure behind it. So it's inherently fragile. We know it has the, exactly the sort of characteristics that mean that it could be fragile if, it, if a bad shock hit it. Are the cyber vulnerabilities high there, too? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know it. And I don't know if anyone has done the exercise, but that is exactly the sort of exercise like this that we ought to be doing. We know, I know this part. <laughs> I don't know this part very well. But together, you could get a much better answer to the question about how, where the cyber risks to a really key, key, vulnerable financial market could hit. So that's the sort of thing we're proposing um, that, uh, that the industry do in cooperation with the regulators and the public sector. Um, and there are definitely efforts in that direction, but I, I, won't, I won't steal anybody else's and I was thunder. Just I'll add, let them talk about it. I was just going to add quickly, as a side note, on this market in particular, there have been so many efforts for reform and there have been so many white papers written that there's a very nice map to how the market actually functions. Um, so should adversaries choose to get extremely smart on this potential market, they have a pretty good idea of how it really works, at least from a flow of funds perspective. Oh, okay, it's going my way. Cheers. All right, hey, Cheers. so um, Cheers to you, Jay. I, I, was trying, I, was, I was hoping for some other karate kid kind of yeah, pass no, on. Yeah, this know, is um, as much as you get. Uh, Cobra Kai. <laughs> um, so uh, what struck me, you know, a lot uh, in what Trish was talking about there, um, you know, when you said that a lot of the cyber risk is focused inside the enterprise itself, um, you know, that's less true now that you've got groups like the financial stability, uh, financial sector, FSR, yeah, look at it. Um, and, um, <laughs> and that's starting to change. 
Um, but it, it did remind me of, of something that you know, we learned in 2008, and we know when there are runs, um, that banks live globally and die nationally, right? die locally, right? That when, when times are good, they're spreading across the board, they're spreading across the board, and then once it starts to go bad, the regulators say, okay, no, these are, these are separate banks. Um, it's headquartered here, we've got this. And I wonder what that means when we start to have internet crises, right? Where what seems global now, when we talk about balkanization, or we talk about sovereign borders now, um, what that looks like when we start to see a cyber crisis, whatever that might mean. You know, we heard earlier about, um, you know, with, with David Sanger in a cyber Pearl Harbor, you know, a place where for national security or other reasons, <coughs> states decide now is the time, you know, now we've got to really control this thing like, like we hadn't. Um, and, I, and I wonder how much is that, that's going to be true. Uh, as we were doing this work, it hit us a lot on well, what is different about cyber risk compared to the, the other financial risks that um, Trish just mentioned. And what really hit me in, in this work and other work I'd done for Zurich Insurance Group was, well, you take the finance sector, which you had said it's a complex adaptive system and it's incredibly opaque. Well, that sure sounds like the internet and cyberspace to us, right? That, um, and, and so now we're trying to understand the interactions between two systems that are both complex, adaptive, and opaque on their own, and then we're trying to mix them together um, into the same batter and trying to figure out what's going to happen out of, out of there. Um, so it becomes really, really difficult. At least the finance sector has said, it, it, you know, you were able to say the financial system is fundamentally fragile. And, right, and that's accepted, and the economist will say, well, of course it's fundamentally fragile. We know that's going to happen. Whereas if I went to an internet conference, um, if I went to Nanog, or if I, if I go to ICANN, one of the others, and I said, well, the, the, you know, the internet, internet's fundamentally fragile, I think I'm gonna get, I think I'm gonna get a lot of argument. I know I'll get an argument if I, if I say, well, what if, if we're looking for a single point of failure, um, what do we do um, if an IT company that's too big to fail, say the cloud, has a Lehman moment? You know, they're with everyone's data on Friday, gone on Monday. I'm gonna get a disagreement, even from folks that you know, I work a lot with, on whether or not that a, a widespread cloud failure is even a reasonable thing, a thing to talk about. Um, it gets to one of the differences. Even though both are complex adaptive systems and opaque, the finance sector is so much farther along in their maturity of studying that risk and trying to understand it. I mean, that's the significant role of economists. Um, that's the significant role of all the risk functions at the banks, right? They've got all of these models to try and figure out, uh, to figure out what those risks are, we can barely get our measurements together on the cyber risk. Um, a few of the other things that really strike me as different um, is uh, one, I'll, I'll do two negative ones and then, and then one positive one. Uh, probably the biggest one is when it comes to intent. Uh, and I liked the way that, you know, as we've been working with Trish, I think you, you've, to paraphrase, when you have a run or you have a financial crisis, Everyone is, being, is acting in their own self-interest to try and limit their losses, and it's just that that self-aligned behavior kind of aligns so that it leads to a bad result. That is really difficult. I mean, I'm sorry, really different from what we worry about, which is that, no, you're going to have an adversary, and it's not just a misalignment of, of self-centered incentives. It's their strategic goal to hit you. And so that means that they're not just gonna hit you once, they're gonna keep hitting you. That they're not just gonna hit you randomly, they're gonna have a plan. They're not just gonna hit you any old day. They're gonna be able to know your systems well enough and know your processes, your business processes, to hopefully be able to pick a time of the peak of the peak vulnerability. Um, actually, they tend to hit Friday around 5 p.m., so we've got about 35 minutes. Um, <laughs> And that is really, that is a very, very different mindset from people that are worrying about just kind of normal accidents or folks that are worried about um, normal, normal um, uh, financial crises. Um, second is most of the time when you're talking about financial risk, the word that, that, I, that I heard again and again was contagion. That the failure mode is something goes bad here and then it spreads out. 
right? And we're using contagion. We're using that word from public health, that there's a patient zero and then others get affected by that. That isn't necessarily the failure mode. I mean, it can be that, right? For example, if a cloud goes <coughs> down, if a major service provider has a technology outage and then others that depend on that um, uh, are, are unable to rely on, on them. We've, we've got a, a lot of examples of that kind of failure. But we've got other mode of failure. It's called a common mode failure. If something goes wrong with, um, uh, we know that adversaries love to attack Microsoft. We know adversaries would love to do more attacking Google or, or, or attacking the other major providers. And if one of them is successful, then we might have an issue not with one bank's or one provider's Microsoft systems. That adversary might be able to affect every Microsoft system wherever it is in the world at roughly the same time. And that's not the kind of problem that we, that we tend to be good at dealing with or to thinking about and thinking about how we're going to respond to that risk. Uh, the, th the, the last difference is, is a positive one. Um, and that is, uh, it really hit us. We, we were at the New York Fed on our uh, conference on this two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, and we're calling it the, the, a workshop on the state of the field to get together with everyone that was thinking about in this space or acting in this space to try and come together so that everybody could know what was going on. And the, um, the official from the New York, the very senior official uh, from the New York Fed, Kevin Styro, that, that kicked it off um, and introduced us, he was really great in talking about how, mentioning the alignment of interests between the private sector and the regulators. And I thought it was a strong point. Now, of course, when it comes to financial crises, maybe, you know, no one wants a finan financial crisis as such. So I won't say this is um, maybe not different, but just especially pronounced in this space, that everyone wants to be pulling in the same direction. The interests all align extremely c closely. It's just a matter of, it's a, the synchronization problem, how we can make sure that we get there best. Now, to close, um, I wanted just to, to come back to the framework, um, come back to the Karate Kid framework, right? I mean, so, you know, Trish talked, we've got our, our technology risks over, our cyber risks over here, we've got our financial risks over here. Catherine had talked about these transmission channels like a single point of failure for the finance sector, a single point of failure for technology. Um, so you, we can go from one side to the other and say, oh, we had the tri-party repo market that Trish discussed. And it's got, for example, uh, some single points of failure of a single, you know, um, a single company that has an important financial function or they're relying on a specific technology. Then we can take that in cyber risks and say, all right, what cyber risks might affect that? We can also use the, the market to go the other way of saying, well, let's just say we had a, you know, an adversary is able to get a good sucker punch in and mi on Microsoft and we have a large scale Microsoft failure or something really devastating happens to take down a cloud provider for a significant period of time. Then we can work the other way and say, um, if this cyber risk happens, how does that affect these transmission mechanisms? So, you know, say a, uh, Microsoft, uh, if someone gets a punch in on Microsoft, that's a lack of IT substitutability because we're all relying on Microsoft and we, don't, we, we probably don't have good workarounds. And then we can say, all right, how does that cascade? Which financial markets are then going to be impacted by that, tech, by that lack of IT substitutability? So we've found the, this, um, this model really good at, uh, at being able to translate and, and go both ways. So with that, thank you. Tom. Okay. And I think you know when we think about these, uh, the, when we think about the response, right? The internally at all of our firms, uh, there's been a lot of things that we kind of almost put these things in one category, whether it be a, a, a physical a denial of access, whether it be a financial stress, uh, whether it be a cyber event. What we have is we have teams of people across the firms that are dealing with each of these. So at a high level, what we're really trying to do is to is to think about these things, the interconnectivity between the financial system, financial market utilities, uh, as Trish described. And I do think this tri-party repo is a great example because what we had was truly an operational function that had manifested itself and created the ability to have this leverage, right? And once that broke down, the impact was felt well beyond the participants in that, in that and, and, and that really drives it out. So when we think about what we're trying to do now at, the, at an industry level is really try to connect in many ways uh, 
the idea that this is a team sport when it comes to this and that, that competitors have to be more open to the idea of sharing information with the right settings in an anonymized fashion that gives people an opportunity to understand the linkages. Because as we push back on the linkages, we can say, okay, pretty clear that from the trading side of, uh, let's say, the treasury market, that there's a lot of things that happen in between that and the financial market utilities like DTCC and Fedwire and other things. But in the middle, there's a lot of things that are going to take place. But as you take that further back into even individual firms, I think what we learn is that there are interconnections here that people may not be completely aware of. Uh, I think if we think about sort of a, uh, you know, the biggest physical disruption, we think about September 11th. Uh, and the tri-party repo market, the clearing market. Leading up to that, uh, the treasury market had six or eight clearing banks. Through consolidation, there were two at that point. And uh, uh, certainly, uh, post, immediately post 9-11, one of those uh, clearers was unable to provide the service. And I would say at the most senior levels of most firms, the idea was, well, can't you just switch to the other one? <laughs> and and, and that, was the, that was the common knowledge. But what happened was the people who were very, very, uh, very, very uh, technically astute in how this worked weren't really connecting to that. So then the follow-on was really what impact would that have on the treasury market, on the funding markets, and on the ability of the markets to function. So I think when, when we take away from that, the idea is even within our own firms, even within before we can even begin this interconnectivity between the financial system, financial market utilities, how we connect back into the cyber efforts that happen, is how do we make these connections in, in these firms first? So another good example I think we think about in 2008, uh, did play, what, were the, what did people do versus what, would, what had their playbook said they might do? So in a financial situation uh, in 2008, I'm sure people had very probably credible recovery plans, credible plans on how they would establish war rooms and put things together, but what really happened was completely different, right? So the question is following these events, whether it be what we saw post the tri-party repo work, whether it be post the financial crisis, is that somehow we all collectively have begun to do things like create rationality between what our playbooks tell us to do in a disruption and what really happens and begin to close that daylight. And you close that daylight through testing uh, and tabletops and things of that nature. But as you begin to work it, as you do that, you begin to realize that there's inter interconnectivity within these organizations. And until we can get to that, it gets much more challenging to broaden that out. So when we think about this idea of uh, of resiliency being a team sport, it starts within the organizations on a front to back basis, making sure that there's clarity in that. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the work that's happening as, as we go further, but the idea also is to accomplish that, we have to understand that things that impact uh, the operational side of the world have significant impacts on, on asset prices and ability to trade and access to markets. And so as we begin to really put all this together under the heading of cyber, the question becomes, in these disruptions, are we, do we have the right people in the right rooms? Have we established command and control in the right way through these playbooks, tabletops, testing, and creating uh, as little daylight as possible between the things that we think we'll do in our playbooks and the things that actually happen in a time of stress, uh, when we, when, you know, when people are under very tight deadlines, much more pressure, uh, and begin to act more independently as mm -hmm. firms, as you laid out, and also individually within firms, where there are people who may be doing a bunch of things to solve what is a cyber problem, but on the other side of the on the other side of the house, there could be things happening on the trading side, and if those two groups actually found themselves in the same room, those types of best practices will probably create much better outcomes. So I think, you know, in this case, uh, a lot of the work has to happen at the firms and ha has been happening, but also down a parallel track, this idea of resiliency at these levels being a team sport among competitors. Uh, and I think we have a lot to talk about on that as we go further. Jay, you want to jump in? Yeah, if I, if I can just add to that a little bit. You know, the, the structure that the Tom had talked about here, right, it's not just at the firms, right? I mean, when, when we had issues in 2008, right, you individual firms who were responding to um, the credit crunch. Uh, and then when it took national and, and supranational response, there, there was plenty of structure, right? I mean, yes. we could say, oh good, we've got, you know, we've got central banks, we've got the Bank for International Sell Settlement, we've got the IMF, we've got, um, we've got the G8. Um, and even when those were, were realized they, these aren't enough, we could use the G8 to build the G20 to say, all right, we need more governance, we need more ways to be able to respond to this. 
That does not exist on the technology side in anything like that, that, that kind of structure. Right? If there is a large-scale cyber crisis um, that happened today, because again, they happen at Friday at 5, um, <laughs> if you had to get the head, heads of state together with serious um, technology and non-technology CEOs, um, with, with ISP CEO, CEOs and the rest, there's no structure to be able to get that together. Um, here, the, the, the chair of the, um, the head of the New York Fed just called all of the CEOs to his conference room and said, all right, guys, we're, let's get together and we're going to solve this and we're not going to leave this weekend until it's fixed. <laughs> Who's going to call that together <laughs> on the cyber side? Right, it's not, it's not gonna be the secretary of DHS, it's not gonna be the White House cyber coordinator, because there ain't one, it's not gonna be John Bolton, um, regardless of the quality of his mustache, right? I mean, and so there's just no one, I think, that has that oomph that can, that can try and pull that together. So, to so let me take this a direction yeah. I wasn't going to take it, so I'm gonna come back to where I gave you the wink and the nod a second ago. The notion of global harmonization came up in a number of conversations today, and Jay, you alluded to they're not being organizations, at least on the cyber side. Let's, let's just talk for a moment about the importance of global harmony in this fight, in particular with the financial system and the global stability. I know Trish has a, a deep view on this. Tom, from a practitioner's point, I'd love your view as well. Um, so, so there's a long history, actually, of international cooperation in standard setting, actually pretty hard standard setting, sort of minimal levels. Uh, lar interestingly enough, largely by informal agreement um, through uh, organizations such as the Basel Committee on Bank Supervision and the securities uh, regulator equivalent, IASCO, uh, and the Committee on Payments and Settlement Systems, it basically standardizes sort of the regulatory structures around um, how the, moon the money gets moved around all over the globe. Um, and the way those work is largely through consensus. They set a minimum of standards and then effectively everybody goes home and convinces their legislatures and their governments to implement something that is at least that tough um, in law. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, that has worked fairly well. They, they, of course, discovered on several occasions in the past that those minimum standards were too minimum, um, and so they have been increased, particularly significantly in the last uh, eight years. But, the, but, the, but there's a history of how to cooperate on those things. Um, I think personally that cyber makes is, is tougher in that regard because as we've suggested, the whole national security intent aspect of cyber um, is pretty much absent from all of the other conversations about, on, about international standard setting when you're thinking about the financial system. It's just not there. Uh, but it, it, you go almost there immediately, as we have regularly the, over the course of the conversation today, particularly the national security co um, concerns. And that ends up being then almost immediately a much tougher conversation, even for bank regulators who agree about a fair amount, a number of things internationally. So while there's a long history there, it's not at all cl clear to me that it is simple. And I have I've certainly... Um, uh, you see hints of that in things like the Financial Stability Board, which is the international coordination mechanism amongst finance ministries and central banks and regulators. Um, they're sort of having a hard time, actually. They've done a couple of very good things, information sharing and so forth at, at a high level, particularly best practices, for example, with smaller emerging and developing economies, which is, I think, incredibly, along with the IMF, and that's incredibly important. But um, the idea of coming to an actual international hard set of agreements on the cyber side is, 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 is tough, despite the, despite the, the better history. And, and a firm like Morgan Stanley, your business doesn't stop at the border. Right, I mean, the, the global nature of this requires that we as a firm think of it that way, but at, at some point we will hit many borders when you get to one of these situations. So I do think the, you know, uh, the approach, I think, uh, at, a, at, a, at an individual firm level has to be global in nature, right? And these practices are probably the it's just things that, we, that are really easy to do generally in terms of sharing best practices and having models. We, these are easy to do globally. We all have financial market utilities. We all have infrastructure. We all know the types of things that we will do in events, how we'll respond to events, or whatever they may be. But we will find ourselves in a situation where uh, the challenges, as we found certainly even during the financial crisis, is or where we do hit those borders and where there's not that type of harmony. And I think it, it, it obviously uh, certainly it would be as challenging, if not more, in this, in this, uh, in this topic. 
No. So let's bring it back home. Um, we were alluding to the fact that we have this micro prudential, micro view of building defenses and an enterprise risk within the firm. And then we have the system question. Our framework is focused at the systemic level, which is also makes it special because a lot of that work hasn't been done. I'd love for Tom to give us a th his thoughts on how the sector is collaborating. You mentioned team sport, yeah. and there's a very interesting and I think important institution that's actually been developed to do this work, and love to, for you to share that. So there's there's been uh, there actually what we're finding is that in the work that we've seen at a, at, a, at a high level industry level when they focus on we can focus on things that are well understood across many participants that it actually be, can begin to drive the micro. So I think what we've seen is that uh, with the work that was done by the financial systemic analysis and resilience sector or or FSR <laughs> not FSR FSR uh, actually was a, a bunch of really really good exercises industry-wide, and I, I just want to touch on... And if uh, I may, will you define who the FSR is? Yes, so the FSR is a, basically, it's made up of 16 firms, eight financial market, in the United States, eight financial market utilities, uh, and eight large firms in the U.S. who collaborate around exercises on particular areas of focus, much like the treasury market, wholesale payments, uh, and messaging, and things like that. The, the treasury market exercise, I think, was one of the uh, one of the more important uh, pieces of work this group did because it was really consistent with some other work. So, folk, if we if we think about the uh, the flash rally in the treasury market a few years back, there's been a lot of work done around you know just finding uh, finding out exactly what happened, the interagency white papers and other things. But follow on to that, the treasury market practices group at the New York Fed had also done a paper on clearing and settlement in the treasury market. So as that work was taking place. Uh, Coincidentally to that, uh, there was a parallel track where the FSR was beginning to run a, uh, a basically an exercise around a, a cyber outage in the treasury market. So these two pieces of work intersected in an extremely productive way because with the basis of this, what was learned is that these impacts will potentially impact the, the single most important market in the world. And as we began to do the work at FSR, followed by the work that was happening at the Treasury Market Practices Group, I think, the, I think the light bulbs that went off were really all about connecting the infrastructure to trading and how we access markets and how those things are so interconnected uh, that it requires this front-to-back approach on it. So what was learned in that was if, for instance, if the exercise, if there was a cyber attack on a small participant uh, or a high frequency trading firm in the treasury market who was accessing the market through an inner dealer broker who was uh, trading with people who clear at one of the central clearing counterparties and you follow it all through. You get the complexity what, here, right? What, the what, would, <laughs> what would actually happen? So, so with the benefit of the maps created by the Treasury Market Practices Group and the, and the, uh, and the, and the subject matter expertise at the FSR and the financial market utilities all in one room, what really came became very clear was that in firms and at an industry level, how the playbooks were going to work required definitely some gaps to be closed. Mm -hmm. And I think the first thing was, in a cyber event that would take place like that, there would be people uh, at every firm who would be looking at it from that perspective, and they would be trying to solve what happened. On the other side of the coin, there potentially could be price abnormalities taking place in the treasury market that people, uh, that people in the trading and sales and trading side of these firms would look at. Now, if you think about those two things happening simultaneously, uh, if you've got all those people in one room, if your playbook said, as we, as we think about something, if we see abnormalities here in a highly automated market, we should automatically think that this potential has a cyber potential and have those two groups working. And as we began to ask firms all the way through, who were they connecting with? It was very clear that the people in technology were connecting with people who might have been once or twice removed, but not necessarily at the trading desk level. And the more we found that we could pull those things together, the quicker we could get the types of resolution. So if you just imagine it, there's a, there's a series of price abnormalities that's being created by a bad actor who has somehow accessed the treasury market and is creating, uh, is creating distortions, a which eventually- will, sorry? A data integrity issue. Sorry? A data integrity issue. Integ yeah, and, and there, or, or you know, in, in some Something where you could see potentially an algo gone wild or something. This is all happening, and there's just and there's now price distortions. Well, half the people in the market are probably making money, so they're over there. So they're not going to do anything. <laughs> right? 
And there's the other half of the people in the market who are sitting there going, I can't believe this, this, makes no, this makes no sense to me, something is wrong. And at every one of these organizations, and at every one of the people in the treasury market who are seeing this, uh, you're going to see people in the cyber groups trying to actually understand what happened and may have data days before, right, that indicated that, that this potentially could be happening, but it hadn't risen to a, a, an escalation point that would find its way to the front office. So I think what we walked away with that exercise was really clearly is that in firm, in each of these financial firms, broadly at an industry level, the ability to pull together the groups that are going to be impacted with the groups who can see the impact, which sounds like pretty straightforward good housekeeping in large organizations are gaps that need to fill. And we're seeing now people take those playbooks away, think about the, how they can do that internally in their firms and create a much better connectivity front to back from trading to, to, to sales, to operations, to financial market infrastructures and everything along the way and understanding that the, 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 this interconnectedness will exist. And I think we talked about interconnectivity in the funding markets. And there's ways that we can make it better, but there's always going to be this, this degree of interconnectivity and the idea that in these uh, types of events that firms do begin to think about their own position uh, is something that we have to clear and we have to get this piece of it again back to being uh, a lot more of a team sport. And, and this is one of the things that I think, and I love that description because I think it's one of the things that we tend to overlook when we think about how vulnerable we are. Right, it's easy to see vulnerabilities like single points of failure or a system that looks fragile and just imagining that you know, with a, with a click, click of your finger, it's going to knock over the right series of things that's gonna cause a disaster, right? I mean, um, th this was actually what Greg Ratchery wrote his PhD on, right? I mean, you had the, in the early days of air power, you had the bomber enthusiasts that said, oh, we can win an air war with Germany, we can win a war with Germany in this many days because uh, with this many B-17 bombers, because we know that we're just gonna be able to knock out the right targets, gonna fall over. And, and they were wrong, and, and thousands of airmen died because they just imagined things were gonna knock over. And I see that a lot with folks that talk about the finance sector, and, and sometimes I even fall into it, in, into it myself, of, of imagining more that because there are fragilities there, that the system doesn't have a lot of resilience. And, and there's so much of the resilience the resilience might be in the systems, especially the technological systems, but the people coming together, and, and this happens at the level of internet too, right? At places like ICANN and Anog and others of people saying, we've got to keep this up, right? I mean, there, there's Apollo 13s happening every day in the finance sector and in the internet of these determined engineers and others coming and saying, oh my God, this disaster is about to happen. Uh, or well in you know 10 minutes and um, and it is and this thing is going to fall apart and we're not going to get these astronauts back unless we get this thing settled right now and that is happening all of the time um, I remember that we were doing it was the very first national cyber war game it was in 2003 called Livewire and I was working I just left Goldman Sachs I was waiting to go to the White House um, I was working with a, a, a guy that had been an options trader, and we were putting together the finance sector attack part of the scenario, right? So we knew something about the finance sector. We knew about cyber attacks to a pretty significant level, and we crafted, I'm oh, sorry, Mwah. like this really evil plan to take down the finance sector. Um, you must pay the rent. And it was, it was really evil because we knew both systems well. And we, we came uh, the first day of the exercise and we kind of did this as a little tabletop to, to, the, to the folks, um, to the finance sector um, respondents, the, the FIBIC, and we're, we're up, ha ha, look what we did. And it was met with insouciance. Because the, um, it was Steve Malfres, who was the, he was the, um, the Greenspan. Is a, the FIBIC is an organization of regulators yeah. um, chaired by the Treasury Department. So it's a governmental committee and that looks at looks at uh, business continuity. And, this, and the, 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 the chair of this group, the Steve Malfres, looked and said, wait a minute, so you're telling me that all of the, uh, so at the end of the week, it's a terrible week, horrible week, but at the end of the week, we've got it solved and we're sure the adversaries are out of the system. Yes, we'll grant you that. Well, okay, then we open Monday with just the previous Friday's prices and that week just never happened. And we were like, what, you, you, you can't do that, like our whole evil attack. <laughs> And it's just like, what do you want us to do? We're never gonna know what was, what was real and what wasn't real. It was such a thorough cyber attack. We'll never figure it out so the week never happened. And here we were with this 
of poop that knew the weaknesses in the system, but we overlooked the strength of senior decision makers that are used to decision making in time of crises and used to making that tough, tough, tough call, knowing that half the people are gonna be really happy because they lost money, and other half are gonna be really angry, and they said, yeah, but they're gonna balance out. So there's gonna be winners and losers. And it was a really, really formative moment for me. So I wanna to get to Q&A because I know that's oh, right. the difference between, uh, I'm not there yet, one second. Because <laughs> I wanna do a quick lightning round with this group about what we need to do next. Quick, not full explanations, oh, but right. you know, what's on your list of the industry, the government, the international community, whatever it may be. Uh, start with Trish. I'm gonna to turn to something I said before about you can't boil the ocean here. The financial system is huge and complicated. I think the exercises, keep it, keep it that, the exercises that the industry is doing are great. How do you set priorities about what's important? And there I think you have to go back to the combination of where the biggest financial vulnerabilities and where do you think your biggest cyber risks are and, pick the, and set your priorities based on the combination of those two things. Jay. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double down on agility. I hate to give the same answer, but so many of our solutions uh, fix one problem, whereas if you do exercises, if you practice your agility and resilience, it's good for whatever the crisis is going to be, but that muscle memory is going to help you out. There's, there's really no substitute for, at every level, organizationally, at a high level, at an industry level, in running these tabletops and getting them as close to real life as possible. And, uh, and, and lastly, I've been dying to say this all day, but 51 years ago today at Columbia, in the middle of a legendary strike, uh, and this, the campus was completely locked down, some young disruptors called the Grateful Dead smuggled themselves into the back of a bread truck and put on a free concert here. So when I think about cyber, somewhere along the way, maybe we're supposed to be looking in the bread truck as opposed to looking out that way. Yeah. And by the way, that makes me want to change my answer to the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> the correct answer is obviously blockchain. <laughs> and I'm going to give my quick answer, and it's, it's, and it's maps. I yeah, yeah. keep maps. saying this, and I've said this. I said this when I was in the government, when I participated in building maps. We're very, very good at uh, mapping cash flows. We're very, very good at mapping how, uh, you know, uh, money and processes and people get from one place to another, I don't think we're as good as mapping technology. And when we can figure out how to systemically link technologies against our market maps, then that could be nirvana. Now it gets back to my comment from earlier that says we sure don't want those maps to land in an adversary's hands because that would be the roadmap, of course, to greatest destruction. Okay, let's go to Q&A. Gentleman right here in the front. I'm okay. We heard about all these uh, different exercises you do to strengthen or to at least uh, measure how the system will s respond. Now, we've had a, quite a bit of uh, uh, work done in, let's say, Netflix and uh, where it started, cha chaos engineering, <laughs> which is actually a uh, real method of attacking systems um, in unexpected ways started out with, with testing systems, but then they moved into production systems. So uh, basically, you attack the system which is in production with a chaos monkey or a chaos gorilla, which is uh, going to attack a data center or a huge cloud provider. So uh, uh, please uh, tell us whether you, you guys have even thought about this. I just, I just heard about this a couple, a couple of weeks ago. I'm, 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 I was a bit behind. Um, it, it, is, it is absolutely incredible, and, and, and what Jim was talking about, is, so Netflix started this, um, it started with the capability, I think it started with chaos, this, called Chaos Monkey, this tool they use, and now they've got this whole concept called chaos engineering about it. It's totally worth looking up, because they said, well, what if we as Netflix were running our whole cloud, and what if um, someone is streaming and a computer goes down? Or what if we're streaming and, an and a district, I don't think they call it district, a district goes down. Or what if an entire region goes down? How can we make sure absolutely seamless service so that our people, uh, that our customers are not going to notice an outage? And they said, well, the right way to do it is we are constantly going to be taking our computers down. They are basically, like you said, self-attacking so that at random points, different computers 
well, they'll just knock offline. They'll just say, all right, your memory buffer is full and, and you've got no more memory left. They'll take in, they can go all the way up to ent taking entire regions down just to do it routinely to make sure the system is still going to work. Um, and then they've got a knock it off button of one that says, all right, <laughs> we really have a crisis. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> we, don't need, we don't need to fake this. And so it's, um, I'm going to say immune system, but it's even more than that, right? The system is attacking itself to make sure that it's going to be resilient. And so it's, it's a really beautiful way of thinking about, uh, about this. Um, and uh, although it reminded me of my brother saying, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself, right? So, um, and so it's a very, very cool engineering principle um, and a different way of thinking yeah. about resilience in, bus in business continuity. And I raised it with, you know, DOD is, uh, I'm always hearing from the Department of Defense and the government saying, oh, I wish the private sector would, why don't they protect themselves better? And at this conference where I was at, where I heard about this, I, I said, well, DOD, well, here's a great idea. Why aren't you doing this on all your networks to make sure that your fighter squadron and your, and your armor um, brigade aren't knocked offline? And I mean, it was met with laughs. All our, oh, we couldn't do that. That's nuts. We can't do that. Okay. Good job, buddy. Okay. <laughs> Gentlemen here. We have time. time for one more question. Oops. Okay. Please. Here. Yeah. Thank you, it's a very general question. Uh, I haven't seen anybody from the federal government the whole day today, except the gentleman from West Virginia, state official. Mm. Uh, what happened? I mean, uh, were they not interested in coming in or they were invited? For the federal government? Yeah, from federal government. Um, I mean, whether it's the state or federal government, we're talking about regulation and I haven't seen anybody from, from the federal government, so. Yeah, I mean, I think, the, so I, I, was, I think amongst us on the panel were, was the most involved in the organi organizing between the four of us. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it was just because we were doing it on Friday, it was a little harder. We had some of the invitations out and, and they, just weren't, they just weren't able to make it up. Um, I think sometimes they, they might not have wanted to travel right before, <laughs> right before Mother's Day. Um, but, um, you know, but we also had General Bansmer just re recently retired. So, um, you know, a lot of us are, are, are farmers of some recency. Um, like, like Greg Ratcher and myself from White House um, and, or, or New York Fed or Department, Department. Uh, or Department of the Treasury. Um, so we certainly don't bear them any malice because we all came from there. Um, but it is something that we'll, we'll make sure we think about for next time. Thank you. Thank you all. Please stay for our reception. We're, oh, oh yeah. okay, we'll, we turn it over to the Dean. Oh.